Amen. Thank you, choir. <clears throat> As we mentioned earlier, today we're going to be continuing on in this Lent series. This is the last Sunday before Holy Week, and so we're going to be continuing down this path that we've been going on by talking about the things in life that create victims out of us. We've talked about how we are victims to our own temptation. We are victims to our health. We are victims of our, of our pursuit of reputation. We are victims of our pursuit of greed. But Christ has claimed victory over all of those things. And so we can live in the victory of Christ over all of it. And so today we're going to be talking about how we can overcome our desire to put on a good appearance, to keep up with appearances. And as, as, a, as a white dad pastor who's about to kiss his 30s or 20s goodbye, thinking it's not my 30s, his 20s goodbye, noticing some things are changing in my life. I brush my hair like this because there's more of my forehead showing than there has been in my life before. My metabolism that didn't keep up with me before doesn't do me any more favors now. It's not a lot of fun to be experiencing some of these changes, and I think it lends itself well that as maybe I talk about my hair or going out of style or my weight or whatever, some of you are thinking like, yeah, right, just wait, but that's exactly why we're talking about overcoming our desire to keep up our appearance. We can't do it. And as a pastor, it gets even more complicated because in, in, whatever, in whatever way, big or small, a pastor is a public figure, which means that my appearance says something. It means that people care about my appearance. Let me tell you what it's like in the life of a pastor who gets dressed on Sunday morning especially. If I dress casually, some people say I'm not dressed nice enough. I'm not dressed formally enough. If I dress formally, some people say I need to be more casual. And some people altogether just say, cover it all up with a robe. So I don't say this because all of those are, are culturally created constructs. Actually, by the church, you have been instructed in those ways. I bring that up to say, it's a losing battle. No matter what we do, somebody doesn't like it. There's nothing that we can possibly do about it. So what are we to do? Especially when you take into account that the church has only complicated this issue further. Because in some church, you, you walk, this is why church websites and Facebook pages and all that are so important. Because before going to a church, what's the first thought you might have? Well, what am I supposed to wear? Can I wear jeans? Do I need slacks? Do I need a jacket? What do I do? The church has made this more complicated by having some services that are to totally, completely ornate some that are totally casual and laid back. So we confuse you, and we confuse you to the highest level. Let me show you a church. This is in Bethlehem in Israel. This church is wild. Uh, this is, it's, it's run by the Greek Orthodox and the Armenian church. So what you're seeing right here is a very ornate, in our culture, gaudy experience, right? This is not a place that most of us would feel too terribly comfortable in. We might look at this and, and think about a, a priest who's wearing a long robe and maybe like a tall pointy hat, right? And that's what we kind of experience. I've got another shot that shows you the altar place kind of from the side. It's breathtaking when you're there in person. It really is, but it's different. But it gets crazier than this. Are you ready to see what's behind me when I take this picture? Let's see. That's what's behind me. Would you believe those are in the same church? Would you believe those are in the same altar place, essentially? See, that's confusing, isn't it? One, this look, the other look we said we would expect a priest with a long white robe and a tall hat, and this one we would think this is where Friar Tuck hangs out. You know what I mean? Totally different experiences. So, the church has instructed you to think that appearances matter and appearances make a difference, but the church has also made the same mistake that we all make, which is that appearances can become an idol to the point where everything has to be perfect, and non-appearance can become an idol, that we have to strip it down so much that our appearance no longer matters. So what are we to do? 
Because we all know that, that we try to keep up our appearances. We can't do it. It changes throughout the course of our life. Because at one moment, when we're young, we want to try and look older. And when we're older, we want to try and look younger. People with straight hair want curly hair. People with curly hair want straight hair. People with light skin try to make it look darker. People with darker skin try to make it look lighter. When we get older, we might concern that, be concerned that our skin is getting looser and, and more wrinkly. We, we care about what's happening, how much hair we have, or what color our hair is. It changes throughout the course of our life, but the one underlying undeniable factor is that you cannot win. You can't win. We are never content with the way that we look, which often is why we try so hard to make ourselves look good, because we want to try to convince ourselves that we're good with it, that we're content about it. But we're not. And thus lies the obvious problem we recognize with trying to keep up with our appearance is that we are never happy. And our focus changes from something that matters to something that really doesn't because it, it bothers us. It would be easy for me to tell you today as a pastor, you know, the outside doesn't really matter. It's what's on the inside that counts. I just told it to the kids, it's true. But the reality as a pastor is like, all of the stuff that I just listed that I'm starting to go through stinks. I don't like it. I think about it. It bothers me. But now what happens is, is my, my, my gaze turns away from the things in my life that matter and working on the things in my life that matter toward what do I look like. And then what happens further with this ideology is that then, oftentimes, what we pay the most attention to with ourselves is the thing we pay most attention to in others. When I'm so focused on my own appearance, often the first thing that I do is I notice the appearance of somebody else. And it sets the tone for everything I think about them. I make all of the assumptions in the world about who they are, what they think, how they live, based on the way that they look. And this is why all over our scriptures from beginning to end, it warns us of the deceitfulness of appearance. Appearance is deceitful. You have wolves in sheep's clothing. You have sheep's in wolf clothing. It warns us of the deceit that happens when we take appearances on the outside level only, and we never go deeper with ourselves and with others. And I can tell you, God doesn't care about your appearance. God has created you in God's own image. Scripture says you're fearfully and wonderfully made. It doesn't mean that your appearance in our world and our culture might not matter or make a difference entirely. It just says it's not important to God. If we want evidence of this, let's take a look at Jesus. Jesus, king of the world, son of God, could have easily come into our world as a king, a beautiful king, ornate and decorated with everything the world would say makes a positive appearance. But he doesn't. That's not the love of God. That's not who Jesus came to love, who Jesus came to serve. Jesus came as a poor Jewish man from a nothing town. See, appearance is bigger than just our physical attributes. Jesus appeared as Mary and Joseph's kid. Out of Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Jesus doesn't care too terribly much about appearances, and this is why it bothers him that some of the religious leaders of the day focused on this appearance so much. We've talked about Jesus butting heads with the Pharisees over their obsession with their reputation, and appearance only adds to their reputation. Jesus is, is, is living his life, and we've reached, reached a moment later on in the story in the life of Jesus or he's growing, he's growing tired of these encounters with these religious leaders. They have just tried to trap Jesus again. 
Jesus recognizes that these guys that keep doing this are nothing but phonies who say one thing on the outside but live a completely different life. Jesus is done with it. And so he offers us what are known as the seven woes, the seven woes to these religious leaders and these Pharisees. He goes after their hypocrisy. Everything is about what it looks like on the outside, but what's happening on the inside is a different picture. Even to the point of the way that these people would give would become a show to make them look good when Jesus says, you are wicked and unrighteous on the inside. And we're going to take a look at one of these woes. Let's see what it says in our scriptures from the book of Matthew. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. So Jesus offers two metaphors here to explain how he views the Pharisees and their concern with their outward appearance. He compares them to a dirty dish that you only clean on the outside so you can look good, but really on the inside, it's a mess. And then he compares them to a tomb, clean and beautiful and crisp and pristine on the outside. If you've you've seen the the Jewish culture, tombs are a big deal. Where they're located, what they look like, it's a big deal. So Jesus is taking something that mattered deeply to these people and trying to get them to think differently about it. He takes a metaphor that would have been significant to them by saying, yeah, the, the outside of your tomb looks pretty, but just like a tomb, you're filled with nothing but death. You look good on the outside, but you're a mess on the inside. We should pay attention to the fact that when Jesus has had it up to here with these hypocrites, that something that's on his list of things to mention is appearance. We should pay attention to the fact that when Jesus mentions all of these things that bother him so greatly about these religious leaders, that they're concerned about the way that they look and the way that they come off, Jesus is sure to mention That should raise red flags for us when we think about how we live as Christians and the teachings of Jesus. Because this is something that connects to all of us. Because the world convinces us to care greatly about our appearance. Any uh, any good clothing company needs to convince you that their item is supreme, that it is luxury, and that you are a luxurious person if you have that on your left breast or in your bag. The world convinces us that in order to land this job or create this relationship or be looked at positively, we have to put on something to look good. And we've mentioned time and time again that often the things we're talking about through the series, like we talked about reputation and how reputation actually matters, appearance matters in our world, doesn't it? There's no way around it. It makes a difference for how we're perceived. But the world convinces us that it's a primary thought for us, that our our outside becomes our our inside identity. But Jesus says that that this idea is, is living like a grave. You're living like a tombstone. And I love that metaphor, even though we talked about how it mattered more. It matters a lot to us, but it matters more to the Jewish culture. But we can still get this picture, right? Imagine a tombstone. People worked hard to to make it look clean and pretty and to decorate it. Does a tombstone tell you anything about the life of the person that's laid next to it? Not really. It might say, you know, father of whoever, mother of whoever, how many kids or grandkids that you had, that you were loved. But does it really give you a picture of the type of person that that tombstone is honoring? 
It doesn't. It means, it means nothing. We, we decorate it, it, it honor it in the sense of honoring the person which is worthy, but it doesn't tell us anything of what's actually in the grave. I have to imagine that if we replace tombstones with like an indestructible glass top to look into the tomb, we probably would have less visitors in our cemeteries, wouldn't we? We wouldn't want to go visit our, our long-lost friend anymore because there wouldn't be anything to look at or what there would be to look at you wouldn't want to. So we live our lives to keep up with outward appearances, but we are dying on the inside or already dead on the inside. But Jesus, so Jesus uses this analogy of a grave to explain why we need to pay attention to what's going on the inside and not worry so much about what's happening on the outside. So as we try to keep up appearances because the world tells us we have to in order to be worthy, in order to be loved, Jesus says, frankly, I don't care what's on the inside or the outside for you to be loved. I care about what's on the inside more than what's on the outside, but you don't have to clean up the outside to talk to me. You don't have to clean up the inside to be in a relationship with me. See, I think, I think Jesus is having a little bit of foreplay as we're a couple weeks here, for, from East, a little foreshadowing here as we head toward Easter. We're a couple weeks away, and Jesus is like a grave. I'm going to pull you out of the grave. You are pulled out of the grave. There is nothing left inside of your tomb, and you're going to walk out of it just like I have walked out of the grave. So what's in it no longer matters because there's nothing in it. The only thing in it is life and life everlasting so why do we focus so much on what's happening on the inside when Jesus empties us out just like a grave? And even if our, even if the way that we keep up appearances doesn't, doesn't live like the Pharisees, we're intentionally trying to hide something that's going on inside. We all buy into this idea of keeping up appearances. We all do. Let me give you an example. Jesus also talks about how it's like a, appearances are like a dirty dish, right? Where we clean it on the outside, but it's dirty and dusty and grimy. And think about, you know, it's got, you know, red stain on the inside of it from your wine or whatever. You don't want to drink out of it. This is, this is just like my house. This is just like my house. Because, because let, me, let me tell you something about the way that I, the way that I live and the difference between me and, and my spouse. I want, I want my house tidy. I don't want stuff to be a mess. Because despite the fact that I have a toddler, like God forbid someone who comes into my house think that there are toys on the floor or that there are dishes in the sink. So I, I just want it away. I don't care where it goes. It can just get shoved in the closet as long as it can hide because it's out of my way. But Brittany is much more like, she, she, can, she can live with the mess for a while. But then when it's time to clean, the label maker comes out. We go to the store and we get tubs and boxes, and we do this thing right. See, <laughs> see I think, I think that, that that way, that Brittany's way is much more Christ-like. Because it's, it's, not, it's not concerned about appearance. The way that I do it is only concerned about appearance. The way Brittany does it is she says, the appearance is what the appearance is. Let's clean our dish, and let's clean it right. My way is much more pharisaical. Hide it in the closet. I don't, I don't, I don't want to show what's the mess that really is my life. I can't let people in. Because they'll recognize that it's a mess. Brittany's way is much more, we all got a mess. Let's make sure we, do, we, we clean it right. And so the question for us today and how we can apply this to our lives is, is what, what do our closets and cabinets and dishes look like in our life? Not literally at your house. Is it a place that you stuff your mess to hide it and cover it up? Or are you much more comfortable and open and recognizing that this is just life? This is just the way life happens. Aging is a part of life. 
Changes are a part of life. And I'm okay with that. But what I'm not okay with is my cup being so dirty that I won't drink from it. What do your closets look like? But, but there's, there's a way that we can claim and experience victory over our focus on appearance. And it's simply when we let others in. When, when we let others inside, we let go of the outside. When we let others inside, we let go of the outside. See, when my, when my close family comes over, I'll get, I'll get their bedroom ready and, and their bathroom ready and all of that. But the toys stay out. The dishes stay in the sink. Maybe I hope my mom washes them. <laughs> but the mess stays out. Why? Because I, I don't care. Because they know my inside. They know my heart. They know my life. That appearance doesn't change the way that they view me as, as a son or as a pastor, or as a husband, or as a dad. So the mess stays. And oftentimes, yeah, they're there to help us clean it up. And our faith community is just like that. Our faith community is just like that, but we have to be brave enough to let them see our messy closets, to let them see our, our, stuff, our stuffed up and disgusting uh, cabinet or closet that we've just hid everything in to cover up the mess. We care about appearances so much. Imagine walking, walking into a house without a, without, a, without a mirror in it. Not in the bathroom, not in the closet, no mirrors at all. It'd be weird, wouldn't it? It'd be odd. Because, I, because that's not the way that we live. But imagine if instead of what mirrors show us on the outside, mirrors actually reveal what's going on on the inside of our lives. What's going on in our hearts. There's no makeup for that. There's no hairdo for that. There's no clothing that fits just right to cover it up. This is, this is who our faith community is for us. They, they not only reveal stuff to us of how we can clean up and change our hearts so we can clean the inside of our dish and the outside of our dish, but they don't just point it out. They walk alongside of us and help us graciously along the way as we work to change our hearts, to empty out our tomb, to clean our dishes. Our faith community is our mirror. This is how, when we let, we have to let others inside if we want to let go of the outside, so that our insides might begin to match our outside, which only reflect the love and grace of Jesus Christ. And you know, we all have to admit that it's tiring to keep up appearances, to keep the house looking just right, to keep ourselves looking just right, keep our dishes out of the sink, to maintain an image at work or at school or in our community. The solution is just to be real. People don't expect anything else out of you if you're real all the time. And oftentimes our financial situation is a factor in our appearance. The American dream, big house, fancy car. A display of wealth and extravagance. But to live the way of Christ and to start to uproot this focus and concern with appearance, we can begin with letting go. And letting go of the money we use to keep up with our appearances. By giving of our finances, we take ourselves off the throne and put God on it instead. We start to pay less attention to how we might be perceived and more attention to the way that God perceives us. To be more attuned to the needs of others. We start to pay less attention to their appearance and begin to care more about their well-being. Which is why this church community is so important because we provide that kind of love for each other and we provide that kind of love for those around us as well. 
You know that right now um, our special offering is going toward the United Methodist Committee on Relief. They're having efforts in, in Turkey and northwest Syria. I don't know if you saw over the weekend, horrible, devastating tornado in, in Mississippi. And I'm sure they will be, if they're not already, they probably are. They will be on the ground there soon. This helps with disaster efforts all across the world, and 100% of your gift goes directly toward the assistance that they provide. You can do that in the small baskets in the back, and you can contribute to that online as well. You know, all the ways to give to all the ministries of the church, they're all before you. You can give online, by text, by mail, by dropping it in the office or in the offering box here in the back of the sanctuary as well. And as we prepare to grow in our generosity, I want to share a prayer with you. Almighty and restoring God, we have been living through some difficult days as churches and as individuals. We experience days when we rise wondering if we will make it through one more day, whether the church will survive for another generation, and we feel like dry bones in the valley. As we offer our tithes and offerings, help us to hear the words of faith, not just with our ears, but with our hearts. That you call us back to life and service out of the graves of despair in which we buried ourselves. It's in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's